Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's event with Dr. Katie Mack and John Scalzi. We are going to be discussing Dr. Mack's book that's new in paperback, The End of Everything, Astrophysically Speaking. My name is Talia. I'm the events manager here at Flyleaf Books. If you're new to Flyleaf, I encourage you to browse our full events calendar by clicking the Flyleaf Books logo above us. I've been adding listings to our calendar for the spring and summer seasons recently, and there are many more to come. So please do follow us on this platform so you don't miss anything. If you'd like to support the store and our guests, please note that The End of Everything, along with many other books from these authors, is available from Flyleaf. We are open for browsing, so you can come in and shop in person or click the link below our faces to buy your copies. If you've already bought a copy, but you want to support the store and our programming, you can send us a couple dollars by clicking the donate button below our faces, and we really appreciate all that support. All right, I will go ahead and introduce our guest tonight. Dr. Katie Mack is a theoretical astrophysicist exploring a range of questions in cosmology, the study of the universe from beginning to end. She's currently an assistant professor of physics at NC State University, where she's also a membership of the leadership in sorry, a member of the leadership in public science cluster. She's been published in a number of popular publications such as Scientific American, Slate, Sky and Telescope, Time, and Cosmos Magazine, where she is a columnist. She can be found on Twitter, where I bet many of you know her from, <laughs> as at Astro Katie. And our special guest tonight, John Scalzi, is one of the most popular science fiction authors of his generation. His debut, Old Man's War, won him the John W. Campbell Award for Best New Writer. His New York Times bestsellers include The Last Colony, Fuzzy Nation, Red Shirts, which won the 2013 Hugo Award for Best Novel, and 2020's The Last Emperor. Material from his blog, Whatever, has also earned him two other Hugo Awards. Scalzi serves as a critic at large for the Los Angeles Times. He lives in Ohio with his wife and daughter. Thank you both so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for having us. This is great. I'm so excited. Um, to keep the focus on both of you, I'm going to go ahead and minimize my, my video and audio and let you guys have a conversation. And I'll pop back up at okay. the end to read out any audience questions. So if anyone watching has any questions for our authors, feel free to use the Ask a Question feature at the bottom of your screen or drop your question in the chat and we'll grab it for the Q&A at the end of the event. All right, so Dr. Mack, you have the floor. Do you wanna go ahead and introduce the book? Sure, yeah, so um, I, uh, so, okay, this is the book. Um, <laughs> Uh, the book, uh, if you're if you're not aware, is about the end of the universe and specifically about a few different ways that it could happen. Um, and uh, I thought I would start with a little a, a little reading from the book, um, just a couple pages uh, from the first of the of the different ways that that I talk about of how the universe could end, um, called the Big Crunch. Um, so, all right. <clears throat> Sorry, I don't. I haven't done that many readings, so I'm, you know, I gotta kind of warm up here. You're gonna be I'm, fine. It's gonna. You're be gonna. Fine. You're gonna follow along, Scott. You'll just let me know if I. If I, I have it. Like you've missed a word. Actually, oh, can you can you do the footnotes? Yes, I can okay. do the footnotes. All right, so, I will. I will pause at the appropriate times, and you can do the footnotes. The footnotes, yeah. if you haven't read the book, are very important. The footnotes okay. are awesome. Okay. <laughs> okay. For as long as we've known that one, the universe started with a big bang, and two, it is currently expanding, the logical next question has been whether it will turn around and come back on itself, ending in a catastrophic big crunch. Starting with some very basic and reasonable physics assumptions, there appear to be only three possibilities for the future of an expanding universe, and they are all fairly direct analogs to what can happen to a ball thrown into the air. You're standing outside on the planet Earth, you throw a baseball straight up. You have inhumanly, an inhumanly good arm, just for the sake of argument, and air resistance isn't a thing. What will happen? In the usual case, the ball goes up for a while, responding to, to the initial push you've given it, but it starts being slowed in its ascent by the gravitational pull of the Earth as soon as it leaves your hand. Technically, the ball and the Earth are both pulling on each other because gravity is a two-way street, but the amount of motion the Earth experiences due to the baseball's gravitational tug is not much. Eventually, it slows so much that it stops dead in the air and reverses course, falling back toward you and the planet you're standing on. 
But if you were to throw the ball incredibly fast, specifically 11.2 kilometers per second, the escape velocity of the Earth, you could in principle give the ball so much of a push that it leaves the Earth entirely, slowing down slightly all the while, and only comes to rest infinitely far in the future, or I suppose when it hits something else. If you throw it even faster, it'll be completely unbound from the Earth and just coast away forever. The physics of an expanding universe follows very similar principles. There's the initial push, the Big Bang, that sets off the expansion, and from that point onward, the gravity of all the stuff in the universe, galaxies, stars, black holes, etc., works against the expansion, trying to slow it down and pull everything back together again. Gravity is a very weak force, the weakest of all forces of nature, but it's also infinite in range and always attractive, so even distant galaxies must pull toward each other. As in the baseball example, the question boils down to whether or not the initial push was enough to counteract all that gravity. We don't even have we, we don't even have to know what the initial push was. If we measure the expansion speed now and also measure the amount of matter in the universe, we can determine whether its gravity will be enough to make the expansion eventually stop. Alternatively, if we can infer the expansion speed in the distant past, we can determine how the expansion is evolving over time today over time by comparing that number against the expansion speed today. You might be wondering if we could just measure the expansion now and 10 years from now and see how it's changed. Unfortunately, our current technology does not allow for measurements this precise, but in the coming decades, we might be able to make this comparison. If our universe were fated to someday suffer a big crunch, the first hint would be seen via just such an extrapolation. Before the collapse began, we'd be able to see that the expansion was faster in the past and had always been and had been slowing down in a specific doom precipitating kind of way. Over time, with an increasing degree of certainty, we'd get signs of impending collapse many billions of years before it officially started. But before we get into the data analysis, let's stop to ask what the transition to a contracting universe and eventual apocalypse would look like once it gets going. That's really what you're here for, after all. Right now, the more distant an object, the faster it recedes, and the, the higher it, and therefore the higher its redshift, the hubble lemaitre law. Um, as an aside, I do talk all about that earlier in the book. You will know what redshift is by the time we get to this point. Uh, <laughs> In a collapse faded universe, this, this pattern will continue right up until the expansion stops completely, that top of the roller coaster moment. But since the speed of light prevents us from seeing the entire universe at once, we'll still perceive distant objects receding long after they start turning around in actuality. Even though in some global sense, the most distant objects are barreling toward us more quickly than nearby ones, the first we see, at first we see the opposite behavior. Every galaxy nearby out to just, just beyond our cosmic neighborhood will appear to slowly come toward us. As with the Andromeda galaxy, its light will be blue shifted. Just beyond those, there will be a distance at which everything seems to be standing still, while more distant objects are red shifted, seeming to recede. Over time, the blue shifted galaxies nearby, uh, blue shifted nearby galaxies approach us faster and faster, and the standstill radius moves out. Soon, we all stop, to, stop worrying about what's going on, what's happening to distant objects, as the rush of nearby galaxies into our region of space becomes impossible, or at least highly inadvisable to ignore. We might be slightly, if naively, reassured by the fact that we will have had some experience with such things by then. In this scenario, the first signs of collapse come long after our collision with Andromeda. Even with the most pessimistic estimates, by any, any big crunch event can only occur many billions of years in the future. Our universe has been around for about 13.8 billion years, and with respect to the possibility of future collapse, it is definitely no more than middle-aged. As we already discussed, the Andromeda-Milky Way collision is unlikely to affect the solar system directly, but the onset of universal collapse is another story entirely. At first, it might look fairly similar, galaxies colliding and rearranging, new stars and black holes igniting, some stellar systems flung off into space. Over time, though, it will become increasingly and terrifyingly clear that something very different is going on. As galaxies get closer and merge more frequently, galaxies across the sky will burst with the blue light of new stars and giant jets of particles and radiation will rip across the intergalactic gas, or rip, rip, will rip through the intergalactic gas. New planets, will, new planets might be born along with those new stars and perhaps, we, perhaps some will have time to develop life, 
Though the terrifying frequency of supernovae in this chaotic collapsing universe might irradiate the new planets clean. The violence of the gravitational interactions between galaxies and between central supermassive black holes will increase, flinging stars out of their own galaxies to end up caught in the gravity of others. But even at, that, at this point, collisions of individual stars will be rare, and they will remain so until very late in the game. The destruction of stars comes about through another process, one that also ensures, with great finality, the destruction of any planetary life that might still be lingering on. Here's how. The expansion of the universe as it is occurring today does more than just stretch out the light of distant galaxies. It also stretches out and dilutes the afterglow of the Big Bang itself. One of the strongest pieces of evidence for the Big Bang, discussed in the previous chapter, is, that the, is the fact that we can actually see it, simply by looking far enough away. What we see, specifically, is a dim glow coming from all directions of light produced in the universe's infancy. That dim glow is actually a direct view of parts of the universe that are so far away that from our perspective, they are still on fire. They're still experiencing the hot early stage of the universe's existence when every part of the cosmos was hot and dense and opaque with roiling plasma like the inside of a star. The light from that long burned out fire has been traveling to us all this time and from sufficiently distant points has just now arrived. The reason we experience this as a low energy diffuse background, the cosmic microwave background, is that the expansion of the universe has stretched out and separated individual photons to the point that they are now merely a bit of faint static. And the fact that they show up as microwaves is due to extreme redshifting. The expansion of the universe can do a lot, including take, taking the heat of an unimaginable inferno and diluting it and stretching it out until it's just a faint microwave hum we might experience only as a tiny bit of static on an old fashioned analog TV. If the expansion of the universe reverses, the diffu this diffusion of radi radiation does too. Suddenly the cosmic microwave background, that innocuous low energy buzz is blue shifting, rapidly increasing in energy and intensity everywhere and heading toward very uncomfortable levels. But that's still not what kills the stars. I'm gonna dun, leave dun, dun, dun. <laughs> Da, 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 da. But what kills the stars, Dr. Mac? I need you to know. Read, you have to read the book for that. <laughs> well, fortunately, I have read the book, so I do know it kills the stars. But the, the passage you just read actually typifies something that I really, really like about this book. I mean, mm -hmm. there's a lot that I like about the book. I'm going to go ahead and just be honest about that. I, I, I've had, I had more fun reading this than pretty much every, any other popular science book that I've read in the last couple of years. But the thing that I love about this is the way that you talk about what is essentially the uh, terrifying and existentially, you know, uh, epochal end of everything mm -hmm. and everything. But you write it in a, in a cadence and style that is just like, oh, and this is cool. And this is cool. Oh, by the way, the entire background radiation, it's coming right at you. That's going to be bad. But it's also awesome. <laughs> right? So, yeah. <laughs> so let's talk about that. Okay. Your enthusiasm mm -hmm. for the end of everything mm -hmm. is both contagious and a little worrying. Right? I, I do actually hear that a lot. <laughs> so, yeah. I've been doing a lot of these kinds of events and um, you know, often I'll be explaining something about, you know, the big crunch or or the heat death or or vacuum decay mm -hmm. and and, pe and people will be like, "Why are you smiling so much?" <laughs> <laughs> I know I don't feel comfortable with this. Right, right. And yeah, and I don't know, I don't know what it is about it that that brings me such joy. I think that um I think it's just, I think it's a mix of things. I think part of it is that it is really interesting science. And as a mm -hmm. physicist, you know, that, that kind of tweaks that part of my brain. And part of it is just like when you, when you laugh as you're going down a roller coaster, you know, it's kind of, it's, it's scary, right? It's, it's, there's this sort of like thrill and, and mortal terror that's kind of built into it. And, and there's nothing you can do about it and there's there's no escape or anything and you all you can really do is just kind of laugh right so so basically what you're saying is to some extent 
uh, the enthusiasm that you have here is a little bit of gallows humor. Is this what I'm hearing? A little, a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it, it's, and you know, I don't know, big, big destructive things tearing the universe apart. That's kind of fun. I, I mean, yeah. that's, like, <laughs> I, I mean, mean, sure. Like in a, in a cinematic, like transformers, you know, sort of way, yeah. right. Where it's all yeah. the special effects going on and such. I yeah. can absolutely see uh, what it is, but I think it's also, I think, as you mentioned, uh, part of it is also just the enthusiasm for the science involved. Right. Yeah. 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 And, and that's, and that's a big thing, you know, um, just it's, it's amazing how much we know about the universe. And it's amazing how much we can learn about the cosmos. And it's fun to think about these big, powerful, distant things. And to know that, that we do have information about that. We have observations. We can, we can write down the equations. We can look through our telescopes. Like we, we know this stuff and that's, that's incredible. And, and it's, it's so much fun to play with these ideas and see, see where it takes you, you know, um, right. what happens if you tweak some parameters in your theory, maybe you tear the universe apart. That's kind of cool. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, and, and, you know, we're not actually doing any of this experimentally. It's all, you know, kind of uh, hypothetical. And so you don't have to worry about the ethical implications. Um, you can just enjoy the ideas and, um, and and I, I I find that stuff so cool, and I find it so cool to talk about it that it's right. uh, it's it's fun to to tell those stories. Now you're you're saying that we are not doing any of any of this sort of stuff uh, uh, experimentally, but you do mention that uh, CERN got yes. sued because yes. someone was concerned that it would actually destroy the universe. You know? Yes, yeah, yeah. So one of the one of the things I read um, as as background reading uh, to for researching this book was a a paper um, talking about potential sort of disaster scenarios for actually a, a previous collider called the R uh, the RHIC collider um, that and that was a similar kind of thing that one was was colliding gold nuclei but it was the same basic idea you smash stuff together you see what happens. And um, and somebody had gone through all of the math on on uh, RHIC to to see if that could make anything bad happen, like you know, because because nobody had ever smashed particles together at those energies before on Earth, right? And so so you're you're creating this super high energy event, like could that create something weird that could then swallow up the Earth? Can you make a black hole? Can you um, you know sort of th throw the universe into another dimension like is there something bad that can happen if you do that and right. um and so i read through this paper and it was it was hilarious to that that somebody actually went through and did all these calculations yeah. i mean it makes sense that somebody would do that but it's yeah. also kind of funny to read um and and the the upshot you know the spoiler that you can't destroy the universe with particle collider and, and the the basic reasoning around that is that particles collide in the universe all the time and they collide at much higher energies than anything we can do. So, you know, we, we're basically sort of smashing rocks together and, and the universe has actual like jets of super powerful high, high energy radiation that smash into, into intergalactic gas. And, and those collisions are just so much more powerful and they have not destroyed <laughs> the universe. Um, so it's, uh, but you know, I mean, it is the sort of thing that, that, um, people do occasionally worry about like, and, sure. and I understand why people worry about it because we're saying, you know, in order to market these, uh, these machines that cost, you know, billions of dollars to build or whatever, we have to say, look, we're going to do something amazing that we've never done before on earth. And we're going to find new data about collisions that we've never seen before. And it's like, Oh, but, uh, but, but don't worry. <laughs> like we know exactly what's going to happen right, exactly. in some ways, you know, I mean, so we're, it's, it's we're a, confirming things as opposed to like, yeah, this yeah. And, and we're looking for new, new things, but none of them are going to be dangerous. <laughs> you know? um, so it's kind of, it, it's, you know, it's kind of a hard thing to communicate there, I think. Sure. Well, no, it's, it reminded me a little, cause I was reading it in the book and it reminded me of, uh, just before they did the Trinity tests, right? The first, mm. you know, there were like, oh, people yeah. like, yeah, is there's a small chance we might actually explode the atmosphere. Yeah, but no, that was, I mean, that was a much bigger deal because that was, that was something that never happened on earth before and could, right. 
like actually affect earth <laughs> you know, right? like nobody i don't think they really knew for sure what would happen with that sure i mean i mean yeah on one hand it would have ended the war but on the other hand not yeah. not the way that they wanted it to no no so i'm gonna i'm gonna admit something to you that i've never okay. admitted to you before and okay. it's not, which is i'm super jealous of you because you had the job i wanted when i was 12 Aww. right you uh -huh. totally do i grew up wanting to well to do two things i wanted to be an astronomer mm -hmm. um and my idol was uh carl sagan because i was the age mm -hmm. where it cosmos was on when i was like 10 and 11 years old right. and yeah. just the way that he explained the universe and all that sort of stuff and i was like that's 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 what i want to do and then mm -hmm. i hit the math wall in like eighth grade like like everything yeah. Yeah. the quadratic equation is a blur mm -hmm. um so so the fact that you are one uh, an astrophysicist, uh, astrophysicist and cosmologist, and two writing really interesting, um, basically service journalism for for science is like this is what I wanted to do when I grew up, and you're getting to do it, and I, I think that's both awesome and like I said, just a smidge and jealous. So talk to me a little bit about first about mm -hmm. how you went into astronomy, astrophysics, mm -hmm. cosmology, um, and then how you knew that explanatory science was also a thing that you wanted to do and was good at. Yeah. So, so, um, you know, I, I, it was sort of similar for, for me when I, when I was a little kid, I, I, I didn't know a lot about Carl Sagan. I was a little bit after the time of, of Cosmos coming out, but I knew a lot about Stephen Hawking and sure. I, I watched a, a, you know, a documentary about him and I read a brief history of time. And, um, I was the sort of kid who was really curious and, and, and I was, I was always tinkering with stuff. So I was, you know, taking things apart and putting them back together and, you know, uh, building stuff and, and trying to understand how it all fit together, how everything works. Right. right. And when I started reading about black holes and space time and all of that, I wanted to know how all that worked too. Right. Like that was, that was like getting into the deeper questions, the deeper, um, parts of, of reality. And so, Stephen Hawking stuff uh, was fascinating to me, and I, you know, he's a great, you know, communicator. He, I mean, he was able to put all this information out into the world, and so I saw that he was called a cosmologist, and so I said, okay, I'm going to be a cosmologist. That's what I want to do, um, and uh, and so I, I, I kind of, you know, went through school uh, and and you know, did the whole physics thing, um, but I was also always really interested in writing and and science fiction as well, and I, I've been reading almost exclusively science fiction since I was a very young child. Um, mm -hmm. And I've always been a writer. I've always, you know, when I was really young, I'd write little stories. I wrote a whole lot of terrible poetry as a teenager. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and then at some point I realized I could kind of bring those two things together and I could write about science mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, sort of combine my interests. And also that would give me a chance to, to share this amazing, you know, enthusiasm, like you know, to to say like this, listen to this amazing thing I just learned. Like I have to tell you about quasars or you know whatever. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and so I got into uh, sort of freelance science writing uh, in kind of grad school and and as as a postdoctoral researcher. And I just I loved it, you know. And I love uh, I love writing about uh, these kinds of things. I love getting other people excited about about science and um, and it gives me a chance to to sort of you know stretch those writing muscles and be a little bit creative and um, and uh, I, I really I really enjoy doing that. And of course now I want to write science fiction so we can we can get you know we have some <laughs> mutual jealousy going on. <laughs> I mean, I mean, the science fiction was a good backup plan for me. You know, it worked out very well. But yeah, it is yeah. that one of the things, the early interest for me in the universe and how the universe was put together uh, and all of that sort of stuff was, uh, became very, very useful when I started uh, writing science fiction. And it's fun for me to see the places where your clearly superior expertise in all this material uh, mm -hmm. combines with the places where I'm just making crap up. Like, right. um, 
you know, I where like for example with the interdependency, which is the trilogy that I just finished with the Last Emperor, um, one of the one of the impetus uh, impeti uh, mm. for 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 this uh, was actually talking uh, was the way my brain was processing brain theory. Right, that's B R A. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, uh, which is explained in this. Um, and uh, po- you know, and the possibility uh, of what happens when completely different universes um, sort of just kind of rub up against each other, uh, mm-hmm. and, and the sparks that come off of that, and that somehow uh, tra- transmogrified into the flow, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So when people ask me about this, like you're just making all this stuff up, I'm like, yes, absolutely, I am, <laughs> but at the same time, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. There is some at least theoretical basis for it. But this is the thing. I want to ask you this as an astrophysicist. When you're Mm -hmm. talking about things like brain theory and, Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the idea of things recurring in a low uh, entropy or a high entropy universe, excuse Mm -hmm. me, all this stuff, it seems like to me that the difference between science fiction Mm -hmm. and theory is really, really like (laughs) micron thin. I mean, explain this to me. Well, I mean, part of that is that you guys are stealing from us, right? Like, well, so, you know, okay. because yeah. we, because we, uh, you know, we come up with weird ideas and then some of them, some of them are, are sort of more cinematically viable than others. Right. And and so right. you, you can, you can work, you know, work with those. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of it is, is we, I mean, we're trying all of astrophysics, all of cosmology is, or, or physics is, is we're trying to, to, construct some kind of mathematical picture of the universe and then see if it matches observations. And we can we can build whatever kind of structure we want over here and then test it against the observations. And and we can go, we can, you know, just really go wild with that. And sometimes we do. <laughs> and sometimes, <laughs> and, and usually that doesn't work out. Usually you 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 know you create some kind of weird structure that's a, a different different sort of shape of the universe or something than, than uh, has been previously considered. And then you check against the data and it's like, no, that's totally ruled out. That does not work. <laughs> um, but every once in a while you get something that's like, eh, actually, you know, maybe that maybe that could could go that way. And, and um, so you mentioned brain theory, my PhD advisor and a colleague of his came up with um, this idea of, of colliding universes that I, I talk about in the, in the bounce chapter where, um, you know, each, our universe lives on a, a brain, a brain, a BRANE, it's like a three dimensional, you know, sort of slice of space kind of, or three dimensional space or something. And you could have another one and they could sort of sm- smash into each other. And I don't know, I don't know how they started with this idea, but but it mm-hmm. turned out that, that if you want to explain what we see as the big bang, it can either be, you know, sort of um, expanding space from a very small, compact sort of, you know, smaller space, uh, hotter space, or you can have a uh, sort of slowly contracting space in, in a way where there's interactions between these, these two brains. And then that can give you the same sort of initial conditions as uh, for the big bang. And just mathematically, you can do that and you can get a, a similar situation. And so, so then they ran with that. And, and now they have a, a sort of different idea that the works in a different way, but, um, right. but every once in a while you can just, you know, like, does this work? Yeah, I guess that, that might work. And then you, and then you run with it until it, until it you slam into the wall of new data and right. then you have to try something else. Um, so, but it does. So, yeah. So basically what we're saying is the, uh, the bumper sticker of cosmology is uh, cosmology. Well, it's not wrong. <laughs> I mean, that's that, all of science is that, right? Like, I mean, if it's, if it's wrong, if it's wrong, then you have to try something else. But if if until it's wrong, you can keep going with that thing, and 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 if it gives you useful predictions, that's great. I mean, it's all about what's useful mm-hmm. for describing the universe, and and we don't know if any of this is really true, right? <laughs> like, right. like we're not we're not really finding ultimate truth. We we we're tr- that's what we want to do. That's what we're motivated by, but. But what we're really doing is we're trying to find something useful. We're trying to build a a little model universe in our equations that Mm -hmm. acts the way the real universe does and maybe gives us some insights into some observations that we haven't done yet. And that's the ideal thing. But we we don't know if our little model universe 
actually looks like the real universe or if it's just you know sort of it happens to reproduce it but actually the real universe you know if you if you it's it's just that we're looking at it sideways that we're getting this picture wrong you know we 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 don't know um but uh but yeah every once in a while it, it gives some really fun fun stuff you can play with um in in the sort of fiction domain and uh yeah. and then you and then you kind of you can go with that yeah. so well, I mean, don't get me wrong. I'm very happy for the things that you guys are playing with because one of the things that I try to do as a science fiction author is get as much of the science that we already know mm -hmm. as correct as possible so that when I extrapolate uh, someone like you or someone, you know, doesn't come in and be like, uh, actually, Scalzi, that's completely, <laughs> completely wrong. And here's why. And then all of a sudden, mm -hmm. you know, I get this email like this. But I think one of the interesting things that, that when you're talking about that and like building these models and then mm -hmm. I think it's sometimes really hard to communicate uh, to people who are not scientists or, or who are not actively engaged in science is that in some ways scientists are just as excited about being grossly wrong and being able to build from that as they mm -hmm. are about being right. Well, so, yeah, I mean, I think that specifically we're excited when we find out someone else is wrong <laughs> so, <laughs> so just just because because you know when you when you write a paper you really do want it to be right in the end you know we you want even though you know that everything's an approximation and we're just building toward ultimate truth you, you want yours to be as close to that ultimate truth as you can be but sure. falsifying other things falsifying previous models is kind of the only way to to advance right and so right. you do I mean, maybe you want to be your, you want to, maybe you want to show that you were previously wrong, but now you're more right. Like that's also, that's good too. Um, but it's, it's all about, uh, yeah, like you have to find the, the, the mistake. You have to find the place where it doesn't, where something doesn't work. Right. Um, right. because then you know, like how to, how to fix up your, your model to make it better. Cause you know that the first one you constructed is not fully correct, right? You, and there's gotta be some, some place where it's wrong but you don't know where it's wrong yet. And so you have to keep kind of pushing at it till you find that. Um, kind of like if you if you know that, you, like if you have a tire that's leaking and you know the tire is leaking but you don't know where the hole is and you have to put it underwater and then you see where the bubbles come up, like that kind of, you know, you have a, a similar kind of thing with the universe. You're trying to do various kinds of observations to see where where it's not right. And then that lets you, that's the only thing that lets you know how to fix it, how to make it better. So for example, recently there's been a whole lot of talk about a couple of experiments that have put pressure on the standard model of particle physics, which is mm -hmm. the, the sort of all the rules we know about how particles interact on a subatomic level. Everything we know about particles in the universe kind of comes from particle physics, from, comes from the standard model and so far, the standard model just kind of keeps passing all the tests we throw at it. Like we keep doing right. experiments and we get the answer we expected. And we're like, that's not great. We, because, because we want, because we want to, we want to see what's where it's wrong. Right. Because that, right. that way we can get the next model, the next, the next theory. And so there've been two experiments in the news in the last couple of months um, that have found, you know, deviations from the standard model predictions and they're not, you know, at the significance yet where we can say we definitely found the place where the standard model breaks, but maybe, you know, and so we're all excited about that. Like we don't want the standard model to pass those tests. I mean, it's like, it's like with gravity, we keep doing tests of gravity and every time we do a test of gravity, it comes out, it's general relativity that Einstein wrote down. We're like, come on, that was a hundred years ago. Like we got to be able to do better. <laughs> we, right, just, right, we, right. Can't, we just keep not breaking general relativity. It's super frustrating. So yeah. So we want to, we want to find something wrong. We don't want necessarily for us to be wrong, but we we want somebody to be wrong. We want to prove it, you know, because sure, um, sure. that's that's where we go from there. Right. So we want yeah. we want physics to have been wrong in some way. Yeah. No, your frustration with Einstein is palpable in this book, by the way. <laughs> right. I mean, come on, he's got to be wrong about something eventually. Right. Well, no, the well, yeah, and that, and well, and that, I think your uh, example actually was really good—the cosmological constant, right? Because mm -hmm. like, when he made that up, you're like, "Oh, come on, come on!" You're yeah. just that is it was it like, wasn't a great idea. It wasn't no. a great idea. It was like there were various problems with it, and they, he shouldn't have come up with it. It was based on bad observations. It was it was a model that that didn't you know that was unstable when he wrote it down, and so he threw it out. Everything's great, and now we've had to bring it right back in. Right, right. Right, and I and and from the great beyond, Einstein's there going, yeah, yeah, 
Yeah. 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 You thought you could mess with me, but no. <laughs> it is I who is messing with you. Right. I thought I thought I was done. They bring bring me right back in. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. General relativity. Stop it. Yeah. You're so old. Why do you have to yeah. be right? But that's yeah. I mean that's a it is a really good point though because when you think about it, um, there's so it's been more than a uh, hundred years now, 1919, mm -hmm. where uh, they did the they did the thing where uh, there was an eclipse and mm -hmm. Mercury slightly shifted, and that proved that some of Einstein's observations were correct. So that's a hundred years of a particular theory being correct. And in between that and now, mm -hmm. so much other stuff has you know, popped up our understanding of the universe. The fact that is it, it is a universe as opposed to, you know, just one yeah. galaxy as an yeah. example. So it must absolutely be frustrating in, in the sense of to almost have the cosmological constant be Einstein, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, it's just, uh, yeah, because because he didn't, he didn't even know there were other galaxies out there. Uh, you know, he put in the cosmological constant to keep our galaxy from collapsing, which doesn't even, that's not even how that works. Um, and it wouldn't have been stable if he'd, if he'd left it there to do that purpose, to keep a stable, to a steady state universe. Um, and so he took it out mm. um, and said, we don't need an anti-gravity term at all. We just have gravity doing its thing. The universe is expanding. That's why it hasn't collapsed yet. And then we find that the universe is accelerating in its expansion. Something has to be out there causing the expansion to speed up and uh and the cosmological constant does the trick and every observation we do it matches exactly with what a cosmological constant would do and i'm like seriously right right um i'm going to pause for a second here to let okay. people know we're, that uh dr mack and i are going to talk for about uh, eight more minutes and then we're going to open it up to questions. There's right here on my screen, at least, there's a button that says, ask a question. Uh, if you have questions for Dr. Mack, go ahead and put them in there. Uh, we have seven questions so far. We don't know what they are. So honestly, um, go ahead and be thinking of things for the next 10 minutes for us to be, uh, you know, to be answering or more specifically for Dr. Mack to be answering. Um, and in the meantime, she and I will continue uh, to uh, talk about things. And um, I want to ask you. Sure. So you talk about various ends of the universe, big yes. crunch the big rip, uh, the, you know, vacuum, uh, and of course the squishy squishy with the brains. Um, mm -hmm. As a scientist, or even just as a human, mm -hmm. which of those endings is the most existentially satisfying for you? Satisfying. Um, usually people ask me which one's my favorite, and I know the answer to that very, very quickly. Um, Satisfying. I I think it's the same one. I think that I think vacuum decay yeah. is is the most satisfying, existentially satisfying, um, because it's very clean, it's very quick, and then everything's just done. It's all over. There's no there's no aftermath. Like nothing is left. It's right. all done. Yeah. So so um, to to for for those watching, if you haven't read it yet, vacuum decay is where a quantum event happens at one point in the universe. We can't predict where or when it will happen. It could happen at any moment. Technically, probably won't read the book if you're worried it's it's going to be okay. But anyway, um, a, this event happens at one point in the universe. It creates a bubble of a different kind of space that we call a true vacuum that expands out through the universe at about the speed of light and destroys everything. And then when it, it, when it hits you, it destroys your particles it, it turns you into a different kind of matter you can't hold together as a as a, as a structure anymore um you are completely obliterated and then once once you're inside the bubble all the space inside the bubble collapses into a black hole and everything's done it's very yeah. it's very clean it's like a self-cleaning apocalypse it's just <laughs> over it's just it's just done i love it i think that's i think that's the way we should go i think that would be that would be fitting it's there's a finality to it that is yeah. re really nice because some of the other ones is just kind of like the universe kind of goes eh, yeah right 
Yeah, right? I mean, the, yeah, like the heat death is the heat death is the worst. I mean, the one that's the one that that we think is probably most likely, and that's that's right. awful because it just it just fades away. Like everything gets colder and darker and emptier and right. lonelier, and then and then it's just it's just you just it just sits there languishing for eternity. Right. Right. That's so fun. You don't want it's that. the party the party that won't end. Right. It's just yeah. sort of like just yeah. yes. We're okay. It's the end of the universe. Yeah. Please. Please go. I mean, I mean, and you can have all sorts of weird, sort of random fluctuations where stuff can randomly appear, like like sort right? of self conscious, like you know, self aware brains in this sort of nightmare scenario. But I mean, you know, that stuff can happen, maybe. Sure. Um, but then it just dis dissolves into the heat death again, and then nothing, nothing comes of it. Right. And it's, right. it's just, it's very sad. We don't want that. We don't want right. that. We want something dramatic. Right. Vacuum. Yeah. It's all. Yeah. It's all fun. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the, and the thing about it is, is it doesn't have to be either or, right? You can right. have one and then fade into the other and all that mm -hmm. sort of stuff. So, yeah. You can oh, combine a few of them. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the additive doom. That's yeah, yeah. the name of my next band, by the way. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the, the thing that really gets me about all of this stuff, right. Mm -hmm. That you're talking about here. Like, like I said, I am a science buff. I am someone who just, you know, eats the stuff up. And even I, you know, this is right at the edge of my ability just to conceptualize it. Like, mm -hmm. you know, and I, part of me wonders, you know, uh, you know, we got three pounds of, you know, <laughs> computing fat up here, right? Yeah, yeah. Is the is the universe destined not to be understood by us in some ways? Uh, is it be literally beyond our ken simply because our, like, like my dog will mm -hmm. never understand physics beyond the right. fact of you throw the ball, it comes down and I can catch it and bring it back. Yeah. Yeah. At some point, don't we become the dog? Um, you know, I don't, I don't know. Um, there, so there, there are two things. One is that I think we're already we're already the dog in some ways, right? Okay. So, so for example, I cannot conceive in my mind of the difference between a million and a billion. Right. I mean, I I work with those numbers. I work with much bigger numbers. I put little exponents on the ten, you know, to arbitrary degrees. Um, I, but to me, it's like a million is is a lot. Is way more than I can can think about and and something in my brain is like yeah maybe double that right you get it it's not like it's not like that at all it's not it's no. the power of a thousand it's it's a much bigger number but right. like my, my brain gives up you know i mean and in terms of the size of the universe you know i can i can sort of envision the size of the city that i live in sure. um you know maybe i can think about the state as how far how long it takes me to drive across it or something and 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 maybe you know and i can think about sitting in an airplane for five hours to get across the the, the continent but like i don't actually i can't actually conceive of how large the earth is that's just much bigger than my brain can handle and then that's just the earth and then the sun and then the solar system and then the next star and the galaxy and the you know right. large-scale structure of the universe I give up. My brain just gives up. It cannot do that. And so right. I have to, I, I, I do these little sort of powers of 10 zoom outs in my head and each power of 10, you know, like I can do, I can do sort of a log scale uh, in my head and, <laughs> and, um, and, and cheat by, by doing that, that um, scaling, but, but I can't actually conceive of, of those numbers. Um, in any in any intuitive sense, I don't know if anybody can. Maybe uh, maybe people can, but for me, it, it it all sort of blurs together. I just use I, I I just fall back on the numbers. So so I don't know if I mean so that might might give us some some difficulty in really conceiving of how the universe mm -hmm. actually works. But we have so many workarounds because we can just put it on a log scale. We we can we can talk about higher dimensions. I mean people who do string theory work in sort of 26 dimensions sometimes. Nobody can right. even imagine the fourth spatial dimension, I don't think. I mean, I've they're, they're sort of apocryphal stories, but I, I kind of doubt it. And most, and none of my colleagues can do that. Um, but you can add on another, you know, 24 or whatever. And it, and it works on the page, it works in the mathematics. And so you just work with the mathematics and you, and you, you learn the rules and you, you uh, work within that, that framework. So, you know, 
I think that I think we'll just keep making tools to help ourselves do this stuff. I don't I don't know that our brains are ever going to move beyond sort of like you know, fight or flight level of, uh, <laughs> of uh, you know, stuff that helped us on the prairies or whatever. But, but I think that if that we, we, we do keep just developing more sophisticated crutches through mathematics and computation. And so I don't think that's going to be the thing that limits us. I, I, I think possibly the thing that limits us is that we have hard limits on what we can learn about the universe at both the largest and the smallest scales. So the small mm -hmm. scales, we have quantum uncertainty. Things are just probabilistic at some some level, and there's nothing we can do about that. We will never sure. be able to say with certainty the velocity and position of a particle at the same time, as far as we know, that the rules of physics don't allow that. And on the larger scales, the observable universe has a limit in the sense that we cannot see beyond about 46 billion light years away, and we never will be able to. And we'll, in fact, we'll be able to see less in the future because of the way the universe is expanding. Galaxies that we can see now are going to be beyond our cosmic horizon. Uh, we will we will not be able to observe large parts of the universe. So, you know, we can't see on the small, small scales. We can't see on the larger scales. Um, and it may be that that means that we'll just never know how the universe began. We'll never know for sure how it's going to end. Uh, at, at some level, like we may, there may, that may prevent us from, from really, really getting to the bottom of the nature of the cosmos, which would be a bummer. I mean, hopefully we can use indirect, <laughs> indirect clues, you know, I mean, we want to know, right? So, right, so we'll right. use indirect clues and hopefully that'll be enough to, to get us to where we want to go with that stuff. But, but yeah, there's always, there's always going to be limits. And I, I do worry a little bit about running into those. Yeah. All right, so we are now at the point where we're going to go ahead and open up uh, to questions. So I'm going to invite our Flyleaf uh, liaison back up, and uh, she's going to do the question thing. You're on. No okay. problem. Um, so the top question is from Mike, who says, was it a challenge to strike a balance between being specific and accurate on the science while also being readable and interesting to a general audience? Yeah, no, I mean, I, that's that's the biggest challenge. Well, I think the biggest challenge in that area was not getting not getting into so much detail that I that you you would get tired by the end of the chapter. Right. So um, so it, it's hard because I I wanted it to be the kind of book where, um, you know, it's it's graspable, but it's not so simplified that you you feel like you're being coddled, right? So I wanted it to be something where maybe maybe once in a while you're gonna have to stop and say, I need to read that paragraph again and read that paragraph again. Like I I was okay with that. Like I want I would rather err on that side than than have it be where you know you you're frustrated because you don't think you're really getting to the bottom of the thing. Um, but at the same time, uh, in you know some of the early drafts of certain chapters. Like I would be tired reading to the end of a paragraph because there was just so much jammed into it, and so the the hard part was was kind of moderating my own enthusiasm <laughs> enough to like to be like, okay, I could go into this for another seven pages, but probably I shouldn't. Here's you know here's the the basic idea. Um, here's enough that you you might feel like you're really you're getting something out of it, but um, but you know here's why I can't go into the the you know, really, really deep detail on it. So, so I did, I did lean on that a little bit. Um, but yeah, I think that one thing that that helped me figure out where to put that balance was just having already done so much writing about stuff like this for the public, and also talking a lot about it on Twitter and places like that, where I get very immediate feedback. If I'm, if I'm talking about something, and I'm going over people's heads, uh, they will tell me that they don't understand, and then I'll answer questions. And like, you, you get a lot of uh, you get a lot of information about what people understand, what what the uh, misconceptions are, um, what people really want to know, even if it's complicated. Uh, so I I think that that Twitter and previous writing and uh, giving talks really helped with sort of where I wanted to pitch that and um, and how how in depth I wanted to go. Hmm. I have a sort of related question here. Mm -hmm. um, let me find it from. From Cordelia, who says, "Why did you want to write a book, and who would you like? What would you? How would you describe the audience? Who is it? 
meant to be for. Yeah, so um, I, I'll, I'll start with the audience. The, I, I feel like the audience for this book, uh, what I had in mind was um, people who are, are curious about the universe, but maybe don't have any real background in science. So, you know, they, they did some science in high school. Maybe they remember some of it, maybe not. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, but they're still interested in these questions. So I didn't, I didn't write it for people who don't care. Like, you know, I, I wasn't trying to like reach out to like people who hate science. Like that wasn't, that wasn't the thing. I, I wanted to write it for curious people who would, who would, you know, who would be interested in, in, in these questions, but maybe had no background at all. So I tried not to assume that, you know, anything about space or, or physics or anything like that. Um, as for why I wanted to write it, uh, I think that, um, so why I wanted to write specifically about the end of the universe is that I, I realized that a lot of the stuff that I didn't actually work on in my research, but enjoyed going to talks about were things that touched on these questions. And I also noticed that when I gave public talks and I mentioned the heat death or vacuum decay or the big rip or whatever, people got really excited about that. Um, and really wanted to know more about how the universe is going to end. And, uh, and I had a lot of fun telling people about that stuff. And there just weren't that many books about the end. There were a whole lot of books about the beginning of the universe. And there weren't very many about the end. And I realized that we're in a point right now in, in physics and cosmology where we are, we're kind of we have these, these couple of branches of where the universe might go. And we're just getting really interesting data about all of this, these questions. And so it's kind of the right time for a book like this that will go through, like, here's what we know, here's what we're just finding out. And we, we only recently learned that this is a possibility. And we only recently learned how to study this. And, and so it, it really tied into what's exciting in physics right now and what people, I found got you know really excited about when I talked about it and and it was just it was fun. I thought I liked the idea of writing a whole book about like the universe being destroyed <laughs> <laughs> because that somehow plugs into what I find amusing and joyful. Um, I thought it would be fun to like destroy the universe five times in a row and 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 also I'd get to throw in all my favorite you know cosmology facts. So that's so goth of you. Uh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> It's such a good frame for a book. It's, you know, like you have the, the, the end point is sort of clear mm -hmm. for all of them, but it's yeah. like, okay, number one, number two, number three. Um, yeah, yeah. And, and, and also, you know, in order to explain all of these different ways the universe could end, I had to get into some really fun physics that people might not have been familiar with. And so the, it was as a, as a kind of educator, I got to sort of sneak in some, some cool physics there too. Right. Um, I have a question here from Alex who asks, of the possible ends of the universe in your book, which do you think is the most likely? Um, so the, the most likely in terms of how we are currently looking at the data is it looks like the heat death. And that's, that's the one where the universe just kind of fades away. Um, and we get that from a pretty direct extrapolation of how the, how the universe is expanding right now. Um, if it's a cosmological constant that's, that's making the expansion speed up, uh, then you then you get to a heat death and um, and it's not that exciting because <laughs> because the universe just sort of fades away. Uh, but on the bright side, it takes a very very long time to happen, so we have a lot of time before you know the universe comes for us, and we just kind of keep going until until the stars burn out. Uh, so that's that's the most likely scenario as far as we know. Uh, but you know, we there's a lot we don't know yet, and specifically there's a lot we don't know about dark energy, which is Whatever's making the universe, whatever is making the universe expand faster. If dark energy is a cosmological constant, then you get to a heat death. Um, if vacuum decay doesn't get you first, uh, and uh, no vacuum decay, go. I know, I know, vacuum decay. It'll it'll come through maybe. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, if the if the if the dark energy is something else, then then you can get sort of more violent uh, stuff going on. Hmm. Um, I have a sort of related question here, who, uh, okay. someone who asks, what is it with cosmologists labeling anything they don't know about as dark? Because it makes it sound <laughs> It does, Ooh. it does make it sound scary and dramatic. Um, for, I think dark matter came along because it just wasn't luminous. 
Uh, so, you know, there, there's luminous matter like stars, and then there's something that you can't see. And, and at the time dark matter was first hypothesized, I don't think that it was really clear whether it could just be like rocks you know, um, all that all that was clear was that there was some there was more matter than what we could see in our photographic plates, right? Um, so that was so it was called dark. Now we should call it invisible matter, and and some cosmologists sort of say we should just call it invisible matter because because the the key thing about dark matter is not that it's dark, but that it's invisible. That light seems to pass right through it. Um, we we cannot see what you know light doesn't get absorbed or reflected by it it's you know no, it doesn't affect light in that way um but uh but then it's but then more even more people are going to think it's not real and uh we're pretty sure it's real so i don't know um it's a trade-off there but uh but yeah so so that one you know is it, there's a historical reason dark energy i don't know why they called it dark energy because it's it's just it's just like it's not a, it's just a, something invisible that's that's throughout the entire universe that does one thing and the one thing it does is is stretch space so it's kind of weird to but like what do you call that so i i don't know i don't know how they came up with the idea of calling it dark energy but they already had they already had dark matter so they're like it just it's part of the same franchise i mean yeah it's it's another mysterious thing that that we do, we can't see and we don't understand we'll call it dark yeah i don't know um, I have a question here from Samuel that I think is really fun, a fun, interesting question that I think could go to both of you. So okay. what is a science fact that you'd like to see more science fiction about? Ooh, uh, hmm. more science fiction about. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I would love to see a, a vacuum, uh, vacuum decay anthology, but all the stories would would end very abruptly. <laughs> yeah, it's it's not it's not easy to uh, dra dramatize that. Although Greg Egan did did write a book uh, that it, that con contains vacuum decay. It's called Shield's Ladder. It's not the same as real vacuum decay. That he he made the the vacuum uh, bubble expand at half the speed of light, so that you could actually have a drama around it. Because um, mm. if it's if it's at the speed of light, you don't see it coming, and there's nothing you can do with that, right? So. Um, so you have to kind of tweak it, but but that's possible. Um, so I feel like uh, I feel like there should be more more science fiction that involves dark matter, but doesn't get it wrong, <laughs> because <laughs> because dark matter shows up all the time in science fiction. It was in um, it was in the the his dark materials uh, uh, you know series. It, it's shown up in Star Trek and like uh, a whole bunch of other places and it's always wrong <laughs> it's just it's no the, because dark matter is not that interesting fundamentally because it's invisible and all it does is gravitate but but still like there's got to be I, a way are you talking about when you say showing up in star trek are you talking about red matter because no no not even red matter so red oh. matter is a whole other thing right the yeah, red yeah, matter yeah. Is, is, no but like they're like they've had the thing where there's like there's a dark matter nebula and it's like it, it I mean, it's not. That's not how it works. Yeah, like if it were dark matter, it wouldn't be a nebula at all. Would yeah, it? yeah. Right. I just watched an episode of of Star Trek Enterprise where they they were going through this dark matter nebula and trying to like set off some kind of uh, charge that would would sort of light up the nebula and and like they didn't they couldn't detect. It. I mean, it was just that's not. It, it was not how it, that was closer than some some place some um, there was. Uh, I watched a, an episode of some newer science fiction thing and I didn't end up finishing it, but they had to route around a dark matter nebula because it was too dangerous to go through. And it's like, it, it's not dangerous. It's just, it's just matter. It just has gravity. It doesn't even interact with you. It passes right through. Nobody cares. Anyway, sorry. Um, I'm a dark matter physicist. So like that it's a, it's, it's personal for me, but um, <laughs> yeah, that's one. I think, I think, I guess my thing is that that one's done too much because of how badly it's usually done. <laughs> maybe, it should, maybe they should do it less. Right. Yeah. Um, we have a fun question uh, and then okay. I think we'll probably need to wrap up because we're getting close okay. to over an hour. Um, so let's see. Um, Dr. Mack, and actually this can go for both of you as well. Do you have a favorite tortilla filling? 
favorite tortilla filling. This is a trap. See, this is a this is a this is a question for Scalzi. Yeah. Um, you know, okay, so so my favorite thing to do with tortillas is you get a gas stove, right? You put the you put the heat on, you put the fire on really low. You take the tortilla, you put it on the stove, and you let it sort of just barely brown a little bit. And you take it with your hands and you flip it over on the on the burner. And you you do this a couple of times till it's like there's just a, a little bit of burned, but it's you know, and then it's crispy. And then you then you butter it up and roll it into a cylinder and you eat it. That's my that's my favorite. Just a plain plain crispy. It's, yeah. yeah, it's it's a Mexican thing. My dad used to do that when I was growing up. Um, yeah. I think he learned it from his his mom. But like that's you know that's that's the that's the ideal of tortilla. And these days I'm vegan, so it's vegan butter, but it tastes exactly the same. Um, sure. And I don't have a I don't have a gas stove anymore, so it's it's a little harder to do. But anyway, that is the best that is the best thing you can do with tortillas. Yeah. They are excellent in, in that. So your context. favorite so your favorite filling is dark matter. <laughs> It's it's butter. It's just you know <laughs> fake butter, but it's it's butter. I'm sorry. I was I was intentionally trying to get you to kill me. Yes. Um, my see, this is the thing. This this is very clearly a trap that has been set for me. People are trying to make me, uh, you know, pin me down. And mm -hmm. no, this is not how it works. The the uh, the tortilla is a universal acceptor. It it will take. <laughs> anything and make it better. So uh, That's as true. far as it goes, That's true. Uh, I, I embrace all fillings. And anybody who's ever seen my burritos on the internet knows this is actually true. So yeah. we're gonna, that's where I'm going to leave that one. I agree. Yeah. All right. So we're going to wrap up shortly. I want to ask you one final question for both of you. And it's a question that I ask at all of my events. Okay. What's something you're working on right now? writing or otherwise and what is a book you are either are currently reading or something you recently read and loved ah um okay so what i'm working on uh right now i mean i'm i'm trying to i'm trying kind of trying to catch up on a bunch of research that i wasn't doing when i was working on the book so uh, I have a couple of fun projects that have to do with dark matter and I'm uh, working on those uh, with some students and with some colleagues and uh, I'm very excited about that stuff. Um, and a book that I've read recently. Um, so the my the most fun new science fiction book I've read recently was called Winter's Orbit by Everina Maxwell. Um, a brand new author, as far as I know, that's her de debut novel, and uh, and it was just it was just super cute and super fun, and I I really loved it. So that was that was the one that I, I I've been telling people uh, to read recently. But I mean, I also I've I've read I mean I I read uh, Fugitive Telemetry by Martha Wells recently. That was great. I read um, uh, the the Galaxy and the Ground Within um, by Becky Chambers just came out. That was really good. I there's there's so many great uh, books out there right now. I'm there's so much to get excited about. Yeah. Um, so I'm writing currently at this moment, like not literally this moment because I'm doing this, but like today i was writing the sequel to this which is the new dispatcher so dispatcher yes. 3 which doesn't have a title yet um that's gonna come out whenever it comes out uh, i don't know what i am reading uh actually uh a friend of both dr mac and i uh named monica byrne has a book that's coming out in september which is called the actual star and i have it here in galley uh and it's fantastic it's a mind blower uh, in the sense of, uh, uh, I was I was saying that one, it's super cool. It takes place in in three different time era, uh, time places. Um, and I got done reading it. I was like, this is amazing. I need to read it again immediately because there's so much that I'm sure that I missed the first time around. Um, it was still fantastic to read the first time around, but I'm looking forward to rereading it because I think it's going to benefit. It's going to reward. Uh, multiple readings, depending on so many other factors. Uh, again, this is going to be coming out in September, and I believe it's from Daw Books. Um, so I'm sure that Flyleaf will have it, and she's actually a local author to you. So oh, uh, that's great. I didn't know based, that. Based in Dur yeah, she's based in Durham. Right. Well, I will. Well, I'll have to email her um, and get her for an event because. Yes. Sounds awesome. Um, I just you put should. a pre-order link in the chat, so if you're interested, you can check awesome. it out there. Um, Excellent. 
All right, so we are gonna go ahead and wrap up. Uh, just a few okay. quick reminders. I encourage everyone to go to our profile on Crowdcast, look at all the events we have coming up because there are a lot of fun ones. Uh, if you'd like to buy a copy of The End of Everything, now in paperback, from Flyleaf or any of John Scalzi's books, uh, you can click the link just below our faces if you want to buy a copy as a gift for someone, maybe, if you've already read it. Um, and if you enjoyed this talk tonight and want to share it with a friend, it will be available as a video. So as soon as we wrap up, it'll convert to a video and you can send anyone just this exact same link. Um, no new link or anything. It'll be in the same place. All right. That's all I got. Thank you both so much for joining us tonight. Thank you everyone for watching and have a good evening. Bye. Bye, -bye Thanks, everyone. everyone. Thanks. This is great.